Welcome, Dr. Wigan here. We're so happy that you have agreed to share your knowledge and expertise about the wonderful and beautiful orchids. And when we think of orchids, I know at least I think of tropical places and that where I'd like to be. I don't really think about orchids um, that could be in my backyard or in Maryland or, or wherever in North America. So um, I'm sure you're going to elucidate us all on the scope and spread and diversity that are our orchids. And we are all ready to have a little bit of spring um, in our lives. So thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so I'm going to uh, welcome everybody. And uh, so we'll, we'll charge through here in the next hour. And uh, they've asked me to, to separate this into a different section. So I've I think I've got that figured out. So I'll get to one point, stop. We can take some questions, and then go to the next, and then then go on. So let me share my screen. And that's the first order of business. And then the question is, do people see my screen? OK, we all set? OK, so, so the title of, of this talk is, uh, the Ecology and Conservation of, of uh, Native Orchids. I'm going to try to move this out of the way a little bit. OK. Um, and uh, as Bronwyn mentioned, I'm, I'm a senior botanist at the Smithsonian. I have uh, I've been there for uh, 44 years. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm the dinosaur on the staff now, and, uh, but still enjoy what I do. And, and uh, many of you obviously know the Smithsonian is that big place in Washington, the largest museum complex in the world. That's not where I work. Uh, the Smithsonian also has what they call research units. And there are a couple of them, and we are one of them. We're the smallest one. And we're located uh, just a little bit south of Annapolis. So before showing you a picture or two, I want to also say that um, the research that I'm going to tell you about and, and our conservation program is, is not just me. It's a small group of us, but uh, we're committed. And the, the three names you see on here are really important people. Julianne McGinnis is, is the uh, program development coordinator. She, she's a contractor with, with us. Uh, Julianne was the director of the Alaska Botanical Garden in Anchorage, and that's where I first met her. Uh, Melissa McCormick is a senior scientist at the same place where I work. She, she's a plant ecologist, but she has a lot of molecular skills. And so uh, she does a lot of molecular research. I'll share a little bit of that with you. And uh, Jay O'Neill was, uh, uh, he's a Baltimore guy, and uh, he was the, a technician in my lab for over 40 years. He recently retired, but he's still doing volunteer work uh, for us. So I don't know how many of you have been to our laboratory. I know Judy, one person here, Judy has. Uh, we're, we have about 3,000 acres located on the Road River uh, south of Annapolis. And our, our property includes forests and wetlands and estuary. And so we're a group of ecologists, uh, about 17 of us, uh, senior scientists doing all kinds of ecological research. What you're looking at here is a, a long-term site on one of our uh, tidal wetlands. Uh, and those things you see all over the place are different experiments uh, on the effects of whatever on wetlands. And, and one of them, uh, I'll run my little arrow here. I think you can see it. This in area in here, is the longest running experiment in the world on the effects of elevated carbon dioxide on a natural ecosystem. And uh, so we do, we have long-term view and, and much of our research is long-term. And this is a view of our laboratory. We actually have one. When I went there, it was a barn. It's no longer a barn, the barn's gone. This is actually the Smithsonian's first lead platinum building. So we're very proud of this uh, facility. My, my laboratory is right in there. And this uh, grassy area you see in the front looks like just a meadow, but there are hundreds and hundreds of wells in the ground there. And we get all of the heating and cooling of this building from the ground out here. That's one of the green features. So, but we're here to talk about orchids. So I'm going to uh, first try to convince you that uh, that's something we ought to care a little bit about. And this is just a picture of a few of our, our native orchids uh, in the US and Canada. So they come in a rich variety of, of, of 
colors and shapes and sizes, and I'm going to share some of that with you. But uh, first of all, uh, I don't know how much you know about orchids. We, we've seen in the chat, some people know about paphiopetalums and dendrobiums and that kind of thing. So the quest, first question you get as a class is uh, how many orchids are there in the world? Are there 2,000 orchids in the world or 25,000 or 6,500? And uh, I guess if I was really smart, there's a way to uh, Glenn, uh, Glenn probably knows the answer to this. It's, it's somewhere between 25 and 30,000. So it turns out it, that is uh, probably the largest plant family of flowering plants on earth. Uh, the others are the grasses and the sun, things in the sunflower family, but there are a lot of orchids out there. So it's a really rich, rich group of plants. Uh, if you ask how many of those 25 to 30,000 have been evaluated in terms of what their status is, whether they're threatened or endangered, that kind of thing, what do you think that number is? Is it 200, 1,000, or 10,000? And uh, again, if we were in a live audience, I'd have you put your hands up, but uh, the answer is about 1,000. So of those 1,000 orchids that people have looked at carefully to find out what their status is, the, the percentage of them that is, are listed as either being vulnerable or threatened or endangered, critically endangered or extinct is, is almost 60%. So that's a very high percentage of the largest flowering plant on earth where a large number of species are in trouble someplace. If we look at the US and Canada, um, how many orchids are in those two countries? Is it 200? Is it 500? Is it a thousand? Again, we would have hands up if you were in front of me, and but I can't see you all, so I won't ask you to put your hands up. The answer is we only have 200, which doesn't seem like a huge number, but uh, we have a lot of the genera. We have about uh, oh, more than 10% of all the genera in the world are in our flora. So we have 200 species. Now, if you were to ask uh, of those 200 species, what percent of them are in trouble either nationally or you know, in Maryland or, or Wyoming or whatever. And it turns out it's almost the same percentage as we find internationally. So well over half of our native orchids are in trouble somewhere. And this is something that I've known for a few years and that's really why I got into this conservation attempt. Because if we have that many things in trouble, we need to do something about it. So in my view, there's a critical need for the conservation of of native orchids. Now there, there are approaches to orchid conservation that have been, have been applied around the world. In, at, at the international level, there's a law that's uh, it's an I, based on IUCN's red list you, on international trade. You can't really trade in orchids unless you get all kind of approval. And in the US, we have the Endangered Species Act, which uh, provides protection to a relatively small number of species. There are people that are involved in conserving land that has a lot of orchids on them. Most of this activity is, is currently being done in, in the South America, in Ecuador, Brazil, and Colombia. So this is basically you buy the land and you lock it up so it can't be developed. Our botanical gardens around the US and around the world have a lot of orchids. Uh, they're really into orchids. They almost all have orchid shows somewhere. But if you went and looked at what they're doing, very, very few of them are doing anything about native orchids. It's, they're not, they tend to not be big and sexy and all that stuff and they just don't do much about them. But we'll come to that later on. The botanical gardens are really important. And then there are efforts to restore orchids, uh, to grow them, put them back into nature. This Eastern Prairie Fringed Orchid is one example. I'm gonna show you a couple of slides of some examples of orchid conservation. This is a program uh, based out of the Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden in Florida. It's called the Million Orchid Project. It has a huge education component. They had have, they have the, this bus, school bus converted into a mobile lab. And you can do everything in this, bill, in this bus you can do in my laboratory, sterile conditions, all kinds of stuff. So they take this around to well over 200 schools in the Miami area. And they also work with those students to grow orchids. That's what's going on up here. And then uh, Jason Downing is the guy in charge of that program. And they take those orchids that they're growing and they go around the streets in, in the greater Miami area and they attach the orchids 
to the trees. This is the way it used to be years and years ago, but you know, no longer. So they're trying to put them back. That's why they call it the Million Orchid Project. You can, they can go to their website. Another guy who's really done a really interesting job is, uh, is uh, Yam Tim Wing in uh, Singapore. Uh, he, he works at the Singapore Botanic Garden. And years ago, he started to uh, see that the native orchids in that area were in trouble, many of them. So he started gathering seeds and figuring out how to grow them. And what he does is he grows them and he puts them on the trees along the streets and in the parks in the city. And that's what you're looking at here, two, two orchids that he's grown from seed. And uh, so when you drive down the highway in Singapore, you get this beautiful display of, of orchids. So that's another way it's done. Uh, I have a, a lot of history working in the Netherlands. I was a professor there for a long time. And uh, most of their orchids occur in grasslands. And these are, uh, you know, most of Europe is developed. And, uh, but they were losing a lot of orchids because farmers weren't cutting the hay any longer or they weren't grazing the fields with sheep. And so the nature con conservation outfit did this kind of thing. They created an area, brought orchids to it, and they manage it, and they've got now over 220 native orchids that you can go and see there. So that's just an example. Uh, uh, Bronwyn asked me, do we have orchids in Maryland? And I said, certainly we do. And what this ma map does is show you where the orchids are in the US and Canada, and the color codes here, shown over here on the left, indicate how many species. And so even if you're up in Alaska, where I do work, research, we have 35 species up there, Maryland has 36, probably more than that. The most, uh, the highest number is down in Florida. And that's because they're, it's warm enough there that they're epiphytic orchids, tropical orchids. And this light colored area out here is, this is mostly in the drier parts of the country where there's still orchids, even 20 in Nevada, but the number is, is less. So we have orchids everywhere. So what is the, I'm gonna stop now. Maybe this would be a time, if anybody has any questions on that, I guess they would unmute themselves and ask the question. And before I go on to the next section, is that the way you want to do it, Bronwyn? You're muted, there you go. Yeah, if they want to put a question in the chat box real quick, um, sure. uh, I, or tell me, I'm trying to look and see if they've raised their hands. If you want to do that too, I can- uh, Glenn Hensley raised his hand. Glenn, you have a question. How long have you been working for the um, orchid um, briefing? Say, say it again, Glenn. I couldn't understand you. I'm sorry. How long have you been doing this? Uh, well, I've been I've been doing orchid research for about forty years, but the orchid conservation work is in the, about the last ten years. Okay, uh, if that's it now. I'm an ecologist, so I, I'm not an orchid grower or an agronomist. I'm a, an ecologist, so I'm interested in the lives of plants. So I'm going to now go through a section where it's going to be a little sciencey. I hope hope it's okay, and I'll try to move through it and point things out. So a lot of what we know about all orchids is has come from people who studied their flowers. And uh, the, this orchid on the left is called uh, Darwin's orchid. And uh, it's an interesting one. It occurs on Madagascar. And Darwin, Darwin actually loved orchids. He's, he published books on orchids. And, uh, and when Darwin saw this orchid on Madagascar, he said, well, this must be pollinated by a moth that has a very long tongue. And the reason he said that is the, this orchid has what I'm showing you here, which is called a spur. And that's where the orchid forms nectar. And it turned out maybe 15 years after Darwin made that prediction, uh, they found the moth. And you can go on YouTube and Google Darwin's orchid, and you can see a video of this hawk moth pollinating Darwin's orchid. Uh, over here, now, now this Darwin's orchid is an example of an orchid that offers a reward to an animal <coughs> to come and pollinate it. Okay, plants like to be pollinated to produce seeds. Many orchids have actually, they're so smart that they have figured out how to trick animals to coming to them to help them produce seeds. And this orchid on the right is an example of that. This is a bee, a fly orchid in Europe in the genus Ophrys. And this flower actually mimics the female of a, of a, a wasp. 
or I'm sorry, a bee. And, and this flower gives off an odor. It looks like a female. It gives off an odor and the male comes and tries to grab a hold of this orchid. And in doing that, it comes up to this part of the orchid where it gets pollen and it cross pollinates. These are called deceptive uh, pollinators and many, many orchid species around the world have evolved this mechanism. And so a lot of what's known about orchid has come from these kind of work. This is probably the weirdest one I know about. <clears throat> this is an orchid in Australia. It's only about uh, four inches tall and uh, it's called the hammer orchid. This one's called the king and carriage orchid. So if, if you looked at this and you were not a trained botanist and I were to say, is this an orchid? You might say, oh, I have no idea. I don't know what these things are. But if you looked at all the flower parts, you would see it has every flower part that an orchid is supposed, supposed to have. And what happens with this orchid is this part of it called the labellum gives off a scent that attracts a male wasp. And the wasp comes and grabs onto this. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll go back. Grabs onto this and tries to fly up in the air where it copulates with the female. But this little hinge right here, what happens is the male starts to fly and he flies right into the female reproductive part of the flower and he gets pollen stuck on his back. And that's amazing evolution. So we could talk more about that, but that's not what we're going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about right now is the life cycle of an orchid. And so plants and animals have life cycles. In the case of orchids, like most plants, they start from seeds. And in, in a seed is the baby orchid called an embryo. So the, the seed germinates and it grows and, and becomes seedling. You all know what those are. You put them in your garden every spring. And then the seedlings get bigger, bigger, become vegetative plants, <coughs> still not flowering. And then they get big enough or old enough and they flower. And when they flower, if they're successful, they produce more seeds. So that's the life cycle of a plant. But orchids have two phases in their lives that make them a little bit different from almost all the plants on earth. One of them is called a protocorm. And the other one is they have what's called a dormant stage. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the dormant, the protocorm. So the baby orchid that's in the seed. Now, most plants, when they, when they form their embryo inside the seed, the mother plant puts some food inside that seed so that when the embryo germinates and begins to grow, it has, it has a jump start. It can start to grow. Orchids uh, have evolved a very different way. Rather than producing a few large seeds, they produce millions of tiny seeds. And the seeds are called dust seeds. You'll see some pictures of them later. And, but inside the seed, there's no food for the baby orchid. And so once the seed germinates for the baby orchid to become a seedling, it has to get its food from something. It doesn't have any stored food. But the key is that all of our native orchids, this stage of the life cycle is not green. And if you're a plant and you're not green, you cannot make your own food. So getting from here to here is a big deal for a protocorn. The dormant stage is interesting. It doesn't occur in all of our native orchids, but quite a few of them. And uh, like if you were studying an orchid in your backyard and you went out one spring and it was there and the next spring it was there and the next spring and you kept doing that because you loved the orchid and you went out one spring and it wasn't there and you'd watch it and maybe it didn't come back the next spring and you'd say, oh, it, it died, you know, it's gone. It turns out that orchids can live below ground without coming above ground for years. We know that one of our lady slippers can live in the soil without coming above ground for over 25 years. And so again, if you are a green plant and you have to get sunlight to get your food, how can you live in the dirt for 25 years and survive? And the answer are fungi. And so fungi are really important in the lives of orchids. In fact, fungi are interact with every life stage of our native orchids and every orchid, no matter where the orchid occurs. And I've made these bars a little bit bigger here just to show you that the food that the orchid gets from the fungus is really important in this stage and this stage. So that's the life cycle of the orchid. There are some orchids, quite a few actually, that have become so successful at, at uh, getting their goodies from fungi that they have evolved to have no leaves. 
they go through their entire life from seed to flowering plant to seed without a green leaf. And obviously they have to do that by getting all of their resources from fungi. There's a term we use to call them, those orchids are called mycoheterotrophic orchids. There's one in Australia that lives below ground and never comes above ground, only when it's shedding its seeds. So it's a successful mechanism and it's this ability of orchids to, to take advantage of fungi. <clears throat> um, now, these are pictures of orchid protocorms. These are four species of orchids that occur in the forest where I work. And I've drawn arrows to show you how tiny the seeds are. These protocorms, here's one, here, here, and here, they come in different sizes and shapes. But you notice they're all white. They're not green. Now, these pictures are taken in the laboratory, and so we and others have figured out how to germinate seeds of some orchids in the lab by putting them on auger and giving them, you know, the right goodies. And that's what these are. But we know absolutely nothing about protocorms in nature, nada, almost no information. Why, why is that the case? Well, it's the case because these seeds are so minuscule, you can't see them in the soil. They're tiny. <clears throat> and even these protocorms are tiny. But we need to know more about protocorms of orchids in nature in order to find out what they're doing. And some years ago, this uh, wonderful woman, uh, Hannah Rasmussen, uh, came over and spent a postdoc in my laboratory. And at that point, she was already working with fungi and orchids, and she trained us. And that's how we got into it. And she and I addressed this whole issue of how do you study orchid seeds in nature? Because we know nothing about them. So she and I came up with a technique shown here where you, you take some kind of netting and you put orchid seeds in it and fold it over and you put it in something. And then you can put that out in nature, you know, anywhere. And that's what's happening here. Here's Melissa McCormick burying seed packets of an orchid in the soil in West Virginia. So these seed packets, <clears throat> we use them to give us two kinds of information. One is we put them in the soil, we bring them back to the lab, we open them up and we see if the seeds have germinated. We have used that kind of information to determine that orchid seeds are really tough. They can live in the soil for long periods of time without germinating or before they germinate. I'm gonna show you something on that in a minute. But even better yet is if we open up one of these little seed packets and, and there's a baby orchid in there like there is here, we can bring this little thing into the lab and do stuff with it to find out what fungus is inside it. Because remember, it wouldn't have grown this large unless it had found the right fungus. So these seed packets are being now, this little simple technique we developed is being used all over the world in, in, in different, it's taken different forms, but it's being used everywhere. So here's an example of that. Here is a, a threatened orchid that we do research on uh, called the small world pagonia. And a colleague of ours, Bill Brumbach, we, uh, he sent us some seeds, we put them in seed packets sent them to him in New Hampshire. He buried them in the soil. 13 years later, he sent us these. We opened them up and we found ungerminated seeds in that seed packet. And we have a technique where we can stain the seeds. And if the embryo in the seed is still alive, it, it starts turning reddish. So these are viable, we think, seeds that have been in the dirt for 13 years. Nobody has known that kind of stuff before. So we're learning a lot. Uh, by the way, that orchid, that one I just showed you, uh, uh, this is a seed packet that we brought in from West Virginia a year ago. And here's one of the protocorms of that Isotria orchid. This is the first time any human being on earth has ever seen this. And so when I opened that up and looked in the microscope, you can imagine this little bearded face had a big smile on it. And very few people have ever seen that. Okay, now I'm gonna tell you about some of the other things we do. This is that same orchid again. And uh, uh, this is a study at Prince William Forest Park, which is south of Washington. And what you're looking at here is the number of plants that we monitor. And the black part of the bar are the sums of all the different populations we work on. The, uh, the gray bar is one population, we'll call it population 15. <clears throat> and you can see that population 15 from when we began to study these plants went down to two plants in 2014. We thought this population was 
going out. Now this, this plant has dormancy, so it doesn't mean they were dead. It just means we weren't seeing them above ground. Well, about 2012 or 13, there was a red maple tree growing on the edge of this area where we study these plants. And we noticed that tree was beginning to die. And it died by about 2016. And look what happened after that tree died. And you can see it really increased. By, when we went back there, we had more plants than we'd ever seen. You, this number here is way above anything over here. Almost all of these plants were completely new to us. And, and they came up big enough that we think they weren't little babies. And so what that meant that all these plants for all these years we were studying this population, they were living below ground. They were alive living off of their fungi. So we've been doing some experiments with this species at two places. This is an army base in Virginia. And this is that park in, in uh, near Washington. So these, these uh, dark green bars are all the other populations that we're looking at over time. You see, they don't change too much. The light green is population is a population that we studied. And then around this year, we, we removed some understory trees and shrubs, not big ones, little things. The idea was to increase the light that would be coming to this place. And we did that and you can see what happened. Had a big increase in the number of plants. We did the same, this is the, the, not the experiment, but what happened at that Prince William Park. Here are the other populations, the dark green. Here's our population 15 down to two plants. And this is when that tree died. And you can see this enormous response at, uh, at that particular site. And we do things like look at how many plants are flowering. And this is the army base. And this is, you can see, uh, these are just plants that flower. These are plants that flowered after we thinned the canopy here. So we had a big increase in sexual reproduction. And this is Prince William Forest Park, and you can see a big increase here. So this is just to, to show that when we increase the light on these plants, we got a lot of new plants appearing that we think they were there before and they got big enough. So obviously light's important, which my guess is you know that. So here's a, a graph of how much light was coming in before we did the thinning, that's this line. So you can see it here. And then after the thinning, and you can see where we thinned and at both sites, the light went up here, here, and here and here. And particularly uh, at uh, Prince William, it stayed higher. And then this is how much those orchids were growing. You can see they didn't grow much. And then after they got more light, they did a lot of growing over here. So again, it shows light is important. This part of it's really interesting because this is at Prince William Forest Park where the growth was really high compared to the site at, at AP Hill. And remember this site, we just cut out some understory small shrubs and trees. This was like a big tree dying. So, you know, a lot more light was coming in. Um, but we think what happened here when we had this huge increase is that the amount of fungi available to the orchid increased. And, uh, and I don't have time to go into it, but what we can do is we can take a soil sample and we know what fungus this orchid interacts with and we can quantify how much fungus is in the soil. So we're in the process of analyzing samples for this time. And we also analyzed how much fungus was in the soil before that tree died. And our preliminary results show that fungal abundance, not, not only is the fungus there, but how much is there is more than 10 times greater after that tree died. We think what happened was that when the tree died, the roots, which are all below ground, started to decompose and that was food for the fungus and the fungus just grew. And we're trying to test that uh, idea. Here's just another example to show you that the quantity of fungus we are, and we're the first lab to really show this, the quantity of fungus is important. So what you're looking at here is how many plants are in an area going from not many to more. And this over here is how much fungus, how, how much fungus is in the soil. And you can see that the more plants are in an area, the more fungus is in the area. And that's for this, this is a different orchid. So this builds the case for orchid quantity. Now, you, by now, you, I hope you're at least a little interested in learning more about the fungi. Hey, Dennis, what, what, can I interrupt you one question? Yeah. 
Uh, this is Bronwyn. Cheryl, just if you could just say what exactly is a protoquorm? I know you keep using it and, and talking about it, but just, just define it a little bit um, a better. Okay. Yeah, when, when an orchid seed germ, an orchid seed has an embryo in it. And when that orchid seed germinates and the embryo comes outside of the, out of the seed packet, the seed, the next stage is called a protocorn. Okay, that help? Good. Yeah, and, and, you're, and you said that it's not, it's just feeding on the fungus and it's not making its own food. It's not making its own food. It can only grow if it interacts with the fungus. Okay. All right. So, so this whole idea of plants interacting with fungi is not new to science at all. We've known this for a long, long time. In fact, there are people that have their whole career studying this stuff. And there are groups of fungi that interact with plants. And what you're looking at th on this diagram is categories of, of uh, fungi that interact with plants. They're called mycorrhiza. And there's this group called ectomycorrhiza. This group interacts with plants in the blueberry family. This, this is another group uh, that interacts with some species. And then for a long time, we've known that orchid have their own fungi that interact with, with the orchids and they are called orchid mycorrhizae. In the old days, people just looked at them under a microscope and you know, gave them a name. <clears throat> uh, it turns out that most of our native orchids we now know interact with orchid mycorrhizae, but many of them also interact with ectomycorrhizae, and I don't have time to really go into that. We could talk about that later. But I want to show you how we go about learning about these fungi in the lab. So what we do is we take an orchid root from the field, that's here, we bring it into the laboratory in a sterile hood, and we look at it under a microscope. And we're, we know enough that we know where to look. And if you look at an orchid root at the right place and look inside that root, what you see is that every cell inside that root is filled with these little things that look like cotton balls. And these are fungi. And th there's a term for them, they're called pelotons. And what we can do in this sterile hood is we know how to tweak out these pelotons from the root. And then we put them on auger plates. And, and if we have, if the fungus is still alive, the orchid hasn't eaten it, uh, that fungus will grow. And then once we grow the fungus, we can store it like you see over here, or we can grow it in, in liquid culture. And once we have it, we then can send it to the molecular laboratory. That's what this stuff, whoops, I'm sorry. That's what this stuff represents. So we send our orchid fungus out, we get its DNA signature back. That's what this represents. And then what we can do is we can go out into the cloud, the internet, and we can compare the DNA of our orchid fungus with the DNA of all the fungi that other people have studied and done the DNA work on it. So that's how we determine what our fungus is. And it's a sort of a summary of what we've learned so far. So molecular techniques are getting better all the time to identify the, the fungus that the orchid interacts with called an orchid mycorrhiza. What we now know is that um, there really are only a few fungal genera that interact with orchids. And these are fungi that by and large are not economically valuable or important and therefore very few people ever study them. That's why we don't know anything about them. In my laboratory, in Melissa's lab, we now have the largest collection, living collection of these orchid mycorrhizae in the world. We have well over probably about 1500 isolates now. And what's really cool is that when we send these things out to do the molecular work and we get the information back and compare it with what's known, look at that number. Over 95% of these fungi are completely new to science. They've never, they've never been named. We don't know really anything about them. So a lot of our research focuses on what's going on with these orchids and the fungi that they interact with. Knowing a little bit about the fungus can, can really be helpful. So this is confusing, I know, but this is, your, this is genealogy. Okay, so these, everything that's on here represents a fungus. And things that are close together are similar to each other. These fungi are very different from those fungi. Okay, you get that part? So what, we could, what I'm showing you here is for four of our orchids that occur at our property on the Smithsonian, what we've done is we've collected the fungi, we've done the molecular analysis, and, and 
So what you're looking at in these numbers on here in letters are the, the codes we give the fungus. This is Maryland 120. That, so that's no big deal. That's what it is. But what this shows us when we do this kind of analysis is that the fungi that interact with this orchid are very different than the fungi that interact with these three other orchids. It turns out this is an orchid that is one of those that doesn't have any leaves. And it lives in the, in the ground, underground, for about 10 to 11 months out of the year. <clears throat> it pops up in the ground, uh, pops up above the ground in uh, October, late September, early October, and produces seeds. That's all it does. It's just a seed machine. But what happens is this fungus is interacting with this kind of fungus, a tomentella, which is one of those funguses that is attached to tree roots. And so what this orchid is, is a parasite on trees. It's getting all of it. And think about that. It, it appears in October when the trees leaves are putting all that food below ground for the winter. And this little dude has figured out how to parasitize a tree indirectly. Uh, these other orchids, uh, go through this quickly now. Uh, this is the tipulary. This is the crane fly orchid that somebody mentioned. So it has its fungi that are here. They're all related. But you see the tipularia also can use fungus that this orchid uses, and it can use fungus that that orchid uses. So tipularia is a, an orchid that can use more than one fungus. The Goodyear, which is a wintergreen orchid, it uses fungi that are all related to each other, whether they're from North Carolina or Georgia. And you'll notice, though, that up here, there are little, little ticks on this line. What that tells us is that these orchids are all a little bit different from each other molecularly. We don't know if they're different species or whatever, but they're a little bit different. That's in contrast to this orchid, the, the Tway Blade, where we've got, in this case, we've got fungi from Maryland and we've got them from Michigan and Iowa and Virginia. And you'll notice this line has no little horizontal ticks on it. What this tells us is that this orchid is really a specialist. It only uses one fungus. And no matter where we get that fungus from, it's identical to every other place we've got that fungus. So if you're talking about orchid conservation with this orchid, you, you have to think about the fungus. Is the fungus there? Is it the right, is it the right fungus? So I could go on and you know, say a whole lot more, but I'm going, I'm going to stop there before I get into the conservation side of this. So maybe this would be a time for me to have a slig of water. And if anybody has any uh, things to put in the chat or ask verbally, now's the time. Yep. Yeah, well, Rick, Rick mentioned that the Maryland Biodiversity Project lists 57 orchid species known. Some are historical or extirpated. Um, just to, to add on there. Yeah. I'm and right. yeah. <laughs> um, what's the benefit uh, to the fungi or the fungi in its relationship to a plant that has no leaves and therefore not photosynthesizing? Uh, that's that's a really interesting question, and and for most of historical time, people have thought that the plant. The, the, the fungus gets no benefit by interacting with an orchid, okay? Uh, it's a one-way street. And I would say, you know, 95% of the research that's been done supports that. But there is evidence now based on the use of isotopes that there may be some benefit coming back to the fungus. So we're just on the edge of having the technology to really look at that issue. My guess is that in the long run, we'll find out that the fungus gets a little bit of benefit from interacting with the orchid, but it's primarily a benefit to the orchid. Because when I showed you those little cotton balls that are in the root of the orchid, what happens is the, the, the fungus gets in there, the orchid controls it where, where it happens, when it happens. But at some point in time, those cells inside the root fill up with those little cotton balls and the orchid, as far as we know, then shuts off communication with the outside world. That fungus connection to the outside part of the fungus is dead, gone. And that, that's when the orchid then starts to eat the fungus. And we know from our work and others that over time it eats that fungus. And um, so that's a, a long-winded answer to the question as we really don't know. But we definitely know that 
the orchid benefits, maybe the fungus gets a little bit of benefit from it. Is there, Kelsey wants to know if there's a scientific term for the orchid fungi relationship. Uh, it depends. Uh, in, in, most people would use the term mutualism where both parties benefit. And there may be, if, if it turns out that the fungus gets a little bit of benefit from being with the orchid, then yeah, mutualism would be the term. In the case of that little orchid that comes up in, uh, in the autumn and is connected to a fungus, is connected to a tree root, that is parasitism. That orchid is a parasite. Uh, there really, we really don't have a term for this sort of one-way street that fits all cases. And um, uh, Raina or Rana uh, is interested, do they, do orchids need only a few fungi or do they benefit from a more diverse community? Don't know the answer to that question extensively because so few people are doing this kind of research. We really don't know what fungus is used by a species across the range of its distribution. Uh, the research so far suggests that at any moment in time, the orchid just has a single orchid mycorrhizae on the inside that it's using. We know from some of our research that they can switch fungi, use, one that, use the same group of fungi, but one that's a little bit different. So again, this is a complex question. The other thing that we're learning now with you know, the advent of all these new technologies is that inside those orchid cells, there are a lot of other little critters it's not just the fungus. And we know that all of our fungi that we isolate and grow in the lab, they have bacteria inside them. And so we're interested in whether or not the presence of a bacterium in some way helps this connection between the orchid and the fungus. Why are the, bac why are the bacteria there? What are they doing? Are they just getting a free ride and, and eating, eating some of the fungus protoplasm or are they doing something that helpful to the orchid. We don't know. It's a, it's complex, obviously. Um, why do the orchids become dormant? And is there a way to prevent dormancy? Don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a, it's a, now dormancy has evolved in many plants around the world, but by far the largest number of species that have adapted dormancy are the orchids, way more than any other plant family. So the orchids have used this. So, you know, the, the traditional way to think about it is, well, they do this to avoid bad conditions. Uh, for example, if, if an orchid is growing in the forest and it's getting shadier and shadier and shadier, uh, maybe it's not making enough food. And so it goes below ground. And we know that happens with the pink lady slipper. And then eventually a tree will die. Light comes back on, orchid pops up. Uh, there's a guy and a colleague of ours, American, who, who's a professor at University of Tokyo, who specializes in this sort of thing. And he really is focused on dormancy. We published a mini authored paper about a year or two ago where he and we analyzed the factors that are associated with plants becoming dormant. We don't know yet. Um, like there's, this is a good, a good um, orchids are a good uh, uh, field to get into since there's so much that we can still learn. If you can get money to study it. <laughs> um, uh, Jack wanted to know if there are any small world uh, populations of Pagonia here. World. In, in Maryland? Yes. It's extinct in Maryland as far as we know. Okay. I'm not convinced it is. Uh, it, it's a species that People, you know, they look for it and, 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 and the more people are stomping around in the woods, the more they found it. It recently was rediscovered in uh, Pennsylvania. It was thought to be extinct there. It was recently rediscovered in New York State. It was thought to be extinct there. Um, we found some new populations in West Virginia. So, so the answer is, as far as we know, it's extinct in Maryland. It used to be here. But no, if it's here, we haven't found it yet. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so now I'm going to I'm going to move into the conservation side of this, and and so the reason for giving you this background information on the ecology is I hope that I've convinced you that 
to conserve an orchid is not a simple matter. It involves knowing something about the fungus, the seeds, the, the habitat the plant lives in, the pollinators, if it needs pollinators. We, we gotta know all this stuff. And so this diagram is really how we view this. This is a puzzle. And in order to conserve an orchid, you really need to put all the pieces of this puzzle together. And to my knowledge, we have not yet put the pieces together for any native orchid, zero. But that's, the, that's what we need to do. So that's why uh, 10 years ago, I decided to do something stupid for an old guy like me. It's to start something new. And so I started the North American Orchid <coughs> Conservation with some initial funding from the Smithsonian and the United States Botanic Garden. And our logo, I hope, captures everything I've been telling you that in order to conserve an orchid, you need to know about the orchid. You need to know about the fungus that it associates with. You need to know something about the ecosystem where you find that orchid. That's what the leaves represent. And to get this all figured out, it takes us. It takes humans to be involved in this process. So we'll go back to our picture of native orchids. And this is our mission. We, we eventually want to conserve all of the native orchids to capturing their genetic diversity and making sure we capture that because you know we all are diverse critters and you don't want just one of one thing you want all that genetic diversity so that's what we're about and so here is our here's our model for conservation it's the only one that i know about maybe with the exception of some work in australia that is focused on the ecology of orchids so we have three sort of pillars for our model one of them is is preservation and so what we want is we want people to help us by going around the country and collecting seeds of all the native orchids from as many places as we can get them and we will store them in seed banks. Another thing we want to do is have people work with us and others to send us roots of native orchids and we will get the fungi out in the way I've told you and we'll store those fungi and then once we have the fungus and the, the seed then we can work with organizations that are into growing things. And that gets us into the next pillar, which is propagation of native orchids. So figuring out how to get the fungus and the seed together and then grow them in the lab and then grow them out in you know wherever with the ultimate goal of being able to use those plants for restoration and putting them in display gardens. And eventually what I would like to see is that all of you on this call who are home gardeners and like native plants, being able to give you the recipe for growing species A, B, C, and D in your backyard. <clears throat> because chances are your backyard was a place where there used to be orchids. So obviously the decline in orchids is in part due to what we've done to the land. And so we need to find out a way to put them back into nature. The third uh, uh, pillar of our work is education. And the reason we do this is we think orchids are the pandas of the plant world. They're cute. And, and we think we could use orchids as a way to sort of get young people like Glenn and others interested in orchids and interested in conservation. So we're, we're all about that. And that's what we hope to do. And I'm gonna talk about some of these things. Uh, we, we have a website that you're welcome to visit. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Uh, we've got these little paper punch out models. I'll show you a picture of, and we've got a, an ongoing uh, classroom activity with orchids. So that's what we're about, but you know, this is not something that just the few of us at the Smithsonian are going to make happen. This has to involve people from all over the country that buy into what it is we're trying to do. And so I spend a lot of my time talking to groups like this, hoping that one of you out there has $2 billion in your back pocket and you're willing to give me $6 million. If you give me $6 million, we will conserve all the native orchids in North America. If it's not you, if you know somebody that has $6 million, Give me a call. So this is all built on the notion of collaboration. And I'm, this, I'm showing you this map just to show you that over these years, we have started to work with organizations such as uh, Atlanta Botanical Garden, Alaska Botanical Garden, and a list of groups here. So we're building a network of collaborators around the country. And, and the way we're implementing this is we, we build what we call regional groups. So these are groups of people, organizations that within one part of the country, which could be a state or a group of states, they help us with the fungal collection, they help us with the seed collection. <clears throat> hopefully there's a botanical garden that'll be involved in propagation, and hopefully they'll work with us on developing educational activities. 
And this shows the map of in the US of our current regional groups. I'm not going to spend time on this. I just showing you the different colors to show you that we've been as busy as we have time to be to you know, bring people into what it is we're trying to, to do. So what do we do? So for fungal banks, I showed you how we get the fungi. So we store them here. We store them in the lab. We store them in the fridge at different temperatures. And what we're hoping, this, by the way, this takes a lot of time and effort. And uh, it's, it takes too much time. We don't have the resources to do this. So what we're currently doing is working on techniques where we can take our fungi and very quickly get them in very teeny samples and store them in liquid nitrogen. And, uh, and basically bank them that way and then pull them out of storage for the other work we need to do. And we're, ha we're having some progress with this. Uh, the, here are organizations that are working with us to do the fungal stuff. Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, Longwood Gardens, the Fairchild and Illinois College. We do the same thing with seeds. Seeds are actually a little bit easier to deal with. Trouble with seeds is that there's, because most people historically have thought that orchid seeds are different than other plant seeds. They haven't been much research on them. So we, we don't have any standard way to store them. But what most people do is store them in the fridge or a freezer, but we think we can also store them in nitrogen. It's fairly easy to do. Uh, people who work with us, uh, we get the seeds, we, we lower the moisture content, we store them in little glass vials and put them where we're gonna put them. And here are some organizations that are working with us on that part of it. We're getting a little bit into propagation. This is just getting off the ground now. The places that are working with us that do a good job of this and are moving forward are the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, Fairchild, Longwood and Mount uh, Cuba. There are others that would like to do this. What we're finding though is most of these uh, organizations, you know, they have a reason for their existence and to take on a whole new program requires resources and they don't have the resources. So it's, it's a slow process. <clears throat> education, what are we doing there? I mentioned that we think that educating the public in, on, in botanical literacy is a worthy goal because most people, probably not people in this audience, but most people don't even know their food comes from. And so we think that we can use plants as sort of a hook to get people interested in, in plants, in orchids, be, and engaging citizen scientists in our efforts to do conservation. So if you want to know more about us, uh, we have this website called the North American Orchid Center.org. You can go there and learn the stuff I've been telling you. We've got a whole bunch of tabs that you can look at. We've got news. There's one up here I would uh, recommend called the gallery for those of you who like to get up in the morning and think of, of nice things to get your day started, get your cup of tea or coffee, go to our gallery. And what we do here is every two months or so, we highlight a, an amateur photographer or artist who loves native orchids and we show their pictures and tell their story. So this is a, a good way to calmly enter your day. Uh, we also have a website called Go Orchids, which you can get to on your phone, or you can get to it on your PC or your laptop. And the we put a lot of our money and energy into this initially. And what this is, it's 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 uh, mirrored after a website called website called Go Botany of the New England Wildflower Society. They were really helpful to us. And this has all of the native orchids in the U.S. and Canada. And you can go into this site. And you can like down here in the left, you could put in Iowa. And the next thing you would see would be a picture of every known orchid in Iowa. And you click on the picture and it takes you into the website where you see a map of distribution, pictures of the orchid, description of its ecology, its pollinators. Basically you keep digging deeper and deeper to find out more about that orchid. And you can, use, you can play orchid science here. You can, if you know a name of an orchid, you put it in here and it'll come up. Or you, if you have, you're out in nature and you have your phone with you uh, and you see an orchid and you don't know what it is, you can go to this way and it'll start asking you questions. And what will happen is you'll see a picture of every known orchid and it'll say like, what are, what's the flower color? And you say yellow. And then what will you'll see next is all the other orchids disappear except the yellow orchids. And then it might ask you, how many leaves does the plant have? And every time you answer a question, it, you see fewer and fewer pictures until you see hopefully your orchid and then you can click on it and learn more about it. Uh, this is available as I said on your phone and laptop and PC. 
it's okay in nature where you can get access to the internet, <clears throat> which is not everywhere. So uh, I have sent a printed version of this to, to a university press. I'm awaiting their answer. And if they agree, probably within about two years, we'll have a field guide that you can take with you anywhere in the US and Canada and identify your, your orchid. Uh, this is one of our educational activities. Um, I saw this first when I was at a meeting in China. And what we have are, are sheets of paper that, and you can get the, you can download the, these and see them all on our website. A sheet of paper that has pieces that you punch out and instructions on the piece of paper that tell you how to put that orchid together. So these are pictures of the constructed orchids. And uh, there's much more information on there than just that. Uh, we tell you a lot. Um, so far, we've developed 27 of these models. We have found funding to print 19 of them. And so we give them out to organizations. Like if you had something at the Natural History Society some evening, an activity, you could get these from us and then people could do things, have fun with them. Uh, we've, we've given out in different ways about 50,000 of these so far. So they're becoming quite popular. <clears throat> and uh, we've just entered a commercial deal with a company that is going to make 20 of these available in a, like a gift box that you can buy off of Amazon or at, you know, at a bookstore and you, in it will be 20 of these models and then a, a about a 48 page booklet that will tell you about those orchids and how to put them together and tell you about us and that kind of thing. So that's one of our educational activities. And this is just pictures of how people have used them, you know, in art displays and orchid shows at weddings, it, they're fun. And we, in a lot of botanical gardens have like orchid day and we, we give them, sell them, give them to them and they, they use them and people like them. So our last thing I wanna talk about our, is our, our classroom activity. This is a spinoff of uh, the Million Orchid Project in Miami. And we got funding for this from, uh, a, a pri uh, from the Smithsonian. And the idea here is to take this into the classroom and let the kids be scientists set up an experiment and run the experiment. And in this case, it's about orchids. So we, we piloted this in 2018 in the Washington area, DC area, in one middle school, three high schools, one science center. And so far about 500 students have participated in this activity. What we do is we train the teachers, we give them everything they need to take this into their classroom to set up the experiment. It's basically like a bunch of shells with lights on them and they put the orchids in there and we, they set up the experiment and the kids take the data. That's what you're seeing over here now. They take the data, they put it on spreadsheets and at the end of the semester, they analyze the data and they give talks. And so they learn what it's like to be a scientist. And uh, here's another example of them setting it up in one of the classrooms in Prince George's County. Uh, this has been really successful. So we've had it out evaluated by an outside evaluator. And we've looked at it from the educator context. And if five being as happy as you can be, we get a 4.6 from the teachers. And here are some of their statements. It teaches the kids to be real scientists, gets them interested in science. And among the students, we got a four out of a five so far. And here are some of their comments. 76% of the students, they're now more interested in science than they were to begin with. And it even get lot, got a lot of kids being more interested in school. I think that's pretty cool. And we think this Orchids in the Classroom program, if we could ever get the funding, has the potential to be a national program to meet, to meet all, the, all the requirements of, the, of any state, any program to teach science to, to students. So we're, we're hot on this one. We think this has some real opportunities. So this is uh, next to the last slide. So here's my view. I'm very biased, of course. Uh, I think orchid conservation is important. I know that orchid conservation is and will be difficult, but we can do it. And I know it's going to take a community of citizen scientists and committed organization to, to do this in the long run. So that's kind of where we're trying to push this. And the other point I want to make is this goes back to the, the person in the audience that has $2 billion. Uh, we don't get any federal money to do this. Uh, the only federal money in here is my salary. So I kind of do this on the side. 
But everything else that we do depends completely on benevolence from people who are willing to donate to us and if we can find contracts to do the work and that sort of thing. So, so this is my call sort of at the end of if you or you know anybody who'd be interested in this, get in touch with us. We'll be happy to tell you more about it and hopefully you would be interested enough to kind of help us live our dream. So with that, back to the slide of our native orchids. And the last thing is just to remind you of what it is I'm trying to accomplish with this orchid conservation effort. So with that, I'm gonna stop. I, I don't know if we still have some time for questions, Bronwyn, I'd be happy to stick around. I'm not going anywhere. I'm home every day now, so let's go yeah. for it. That's, this is great, Dennis. Can you unshare? We can all come back together. There's a couple of questions and I'm sure yes. that, that uh, we come back together as a whole. Thank you so much. I'm so excited about what you're doing. Um, and um, I'm gonna just go back here. Someone had a question that I can't find it. Oh, here it is, Betsy. She wanted to know about deer browsing on native orchids. Is that a problem? It's been shown to be a problem. There, there's one publication from Maryland from work that was done up in the Catoctin Mountains where uh, uh, Wes Knapp and a, got connected with a guy who had been studying orchid populations for some years up there. And this fellow had been taking notes and he noticed that the, the, it, it, they were becoming less common. And, uh, and what Wes did was to get deer data from Maryland DNR. And he put those two things together and he showed that with deer going up, orchids were going down. And so, yes, it's a problem. The answer is yes. Uh, if you're talking about a, uh, a really rare thing, you probably want to do something to keep the deer from eating it. There are some orchids that the deer don't seem to bother, things with fuzzy leaves and that kind of thing. What we do in our monitoring work with the small world pagonia is uh, we put cages over all the plants to keep the deer away. Now, the orchids that are at Cirque that you know, I know about that are in our forest uh, that we see all the time, there are none of them that seem to be, be decimated by the deer. Uh, they all seem to be hanging in there. I, I, every once in a while, I'll see a deer would have chewed the fruit off of an orchid or it might chew a leaf, but usually there's enough in our forest that the deer, unless they just stumble onto something, they, they don't bother the orchids too much. But I have seen places where, you know, they, they find them and they just chomp them off. So it's, it can be a problem. A uh, few people are interested in the uh, orchid gami and the classroom program. Are you accepting other people? And how is the best way to get in touch with you? Or who, who should they get in touch with to, to get more information? Yeah, uh, hopefully, you know, you, you, you can get my web. You can Google and get my website through CERC. Uh, it's, it's Wiggum. It's my name with a D at si.edu. Or you could, the other thing you can do is you can go on the, the NAOC website and you can, you can email NAOC and you can contact us that way. And, uh, and so with the Orkagamis, uh, yeah, we can make them available. What we, what we do is we try to recoup the money, you know, so we can reprint them. And so depending on whether you're, you know, you're a per, for profit organization or an educational organization, you know, we'd like you to contribute to that, I think like, I would say, I think at the bottom is like 50 cents a sheet for them. They're not that expensive. It costs, you know, that barely gives us enough to break even. Okay. Um, Glenn wants to share his screen and show us something and I'll go ahead and let you do that. Now you should have an opportunity. You should, you should be able to share your screen, Glenn. You want to unmute? Oh. Uh-huh, the J-W-O-R-G. Okay, thanks, Ben. I'm going to look at that one. Costa Rica is one of the hot orchid hotspots around the world. That's where the Dracula orchids are. Oh, wow. They look like Dracula. If you go onto our NAOC website and go into our gallery and look at the archives part of that, Every October, we put up a display of spooky orchids. 
and one of them is the Dracula. Um, do, do you don't want people collecting seeds or or no. or anything like that because that kind of came out, and I just wanted you to clarify that. No, uh, when we when we work with people to help us with our conservation effort, we have a a series of protocols that we give to people so they understand what the deal is. And one is that the collector has to agree to the rules of the road, i.e. you don't disclose the location of the orchid, you don't go onto anybody's property without their approval. We have another form that uh, the landowner has to approve, sign, because we don't want anybody going on anybody's property taking an orchid without their permission. Otherwise, I go to jail. Uh, that's not good. And then uh, we also have a whole series of protocols that we you know, basically train people on how they go about making the collections. So you got to do it carefully. You got to do it just right. So we ask people to collect leaves, seeds, and a root. And again, if you get into this and we kind of make a connection with that, uh, obviously you have to be trained and follow the rules. Right, right. Because it doesn't do any good for us to get a sample that's crummy. Um, okay, any other questions from folks? You can raise your hand or put something in the chat box. I have a question. Go ahead, Brad. Uh, Dr. Reagan, first of all, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. Appreciate everything you talked about tonight. And um, as an instructor, as a, a college professor myself, I'm very interested in your classroom um, uh, presentations and experiences. So I'm going to look on your website. I'm assuming there's a lot of information about that. And, yeah. Uh, uh, are you talking specifically, you're asking about the orchids in the classroom or just in general? The orchids in the classroom and other things in general. So I know yeah. you have a lot of microbiology experience. So are there going to be some techniques in there that I could look at about uh, the microbiological aspects with the uh, mycorrhiza? Well, not not in the not in the in the middle schools and high schools. Those experiments are more like uh, if you grow the orchid in medium A and medium B and medium C with and without fungi, which one grows the best? I see. Okay. So we try we try to set it up in a way that uh, gives us some information that you know expands our understanding, but also that interests the kids and they they have the resources to to work with. Uh, we have another one. We're just starting up this spring with uh, with one of the schools where because we can't be outside and kids aren't in school, is we're doing a uh, a seed germination experiment. So what we do is we make the the petri dishes with the auger, we put the seeds in there, we send them to the teachers and with the, the guidelines on how they go about and what, and they send them home to the kids and the kids can look at their orchid seeds. You know, we, you know these deals, you can take your, your cell phone now and they have these things you clip on them or like microscopes and they can actually go in there and they can count, you know, how big the seed, how many seeds have germinated, have they swollen so we're, you know, we're thinking of ways to, you know, make this more meaningful for, for the students. If you're interested in this, Fred, uh, there are two, there's a person on our staff who works in our uh, outreach area that are, man, are managing the orchids in the classroom program. And I can put you in touch with, with them if you reach out to me. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And my sister, who is also listening here tonight, is a high school teacher in Montgomery County. So Okay. Well, we, yeah, we've worked in Montgomery County. Yeah. And we, right. again, the, we have all these guidelines written out. These women know how to do this. So yeah. That's great. Okay. Um, <laughs> I do have a second question, but I, I can let someone else go first and then I can ask after if there's another person that wants to ask. Go ahead, Fred, while, you, while, you're, while you're unmuted. Oh, okay. Thanks. In regards to pollinators, um, there's a very specific relationship oftentimes with insect pollinators and a particular species of orchids, as you know. Um, what do we know about our native orchids in terms of their uh, pollinators? Is there any clear work done on that? I know probably some of them are known, but there's probably a lot of them that are unknown. And I was wondering if there's uh, any definitive work that's been done with that. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, we know what 
insects are involved in pollinating some orchids. There are a lot of orchids we have no information for. Right. Because people just haven't you know, been out there to, to do it. Um, so you can look in the literature and you can find that that's information. Uh, one, of our, uh, one of our PhD students uh, work, is working with us on a, uh, a project where we're gonna try to get uh, uh, game cameras and, and put them out and see if they can capture what the pollinators are. So there are techniques that are being developed now that, so you don't have to, I did a, I did a study of the crane fly orchid many years ago, a pollination study, and, and I had to sit out in the woods every night with a flashlight. <laughs> so uh, so we're, we're, getting, we're getting beyond that. But yeah, we, uh, there, there, there are, actually there are some, uh, uh, there's, if you want to look at something on YouTube, uh, I would say look at look for that drachea, that Australian orchid, pollination of drachea. That's a good one. And uh, there's a an orchid in Florida that has received a lot of attention called the ghost orchid, and it was thought not extinct, but the numbers went way down. And uh, actually, there was a recent TV program where these guys with super fancy equipment were out there for days and hours and weeks capturing pollination of the uh, ghost orchid. And you can, you can get that on YouTube too. That's a, that's a, good, that's a good look. Yeah. Regina had her hand up. Is Regina still here? And also, oh, let me back up while Regina's getting in. Uh, there are also on the video on YouTube, uh, you can look for pollination of lady slipper orchids. That's, that's a whole really interesting story there. There's some good stuff on that. Okay, I don't see her coming on. If, if people are more interested in getting orchids um, uh, in their landscape, is there, is there some, are there nurseries that do that or no, it's just not? You, you, can, you can Google and you can find uh, places to buy orchids and you can buy them and you can attempt to grow them. Uh, you know, as long as it's not dug out of the wild, we don't have any problem with that. Mm -hmm. uh, is that helping the population any or? Well, I mean, it's not, it's not happening at a high enough level to have any effect and, and you know, there are a few people that are pretty good at it, you know, creating little bogs in their yard and doing different things to grow orchids and they survive nicely. A lot of that stuff is coming from, uh, you know, it might be the wrong genetic diversity. Like if you buy a lady slipper from a guy in Minnesota that is really good at growing them, bring it to Maryland. If it does survive, you know, that's not the genes from Maryland. So what we're hoping at some point in time, if we have, if we're successful with the propagation side of this, for each state, we will be able to have local genetic material producing plants that you can grow locally. That's that's the ultimate goal. We're, yeah. we're not we're not. I, I'll be I'll be on the other side of the green when that happens. But you know, that's the ultimate goal. And that, um, like with the seed banks um, and orchid collection, are are there any historic uh, collections that you can now go back to and try to extract some of that fungal information out of or DNA information out of? People are doing a little bit of that. Uh, a lot of times, you know, things that are in old collections have been fumigated and, you know, they've been treated in ways where you can't get, my, you, you certainly could not get any, any live, uh, anything alive out of it. But, um, but these days, you just need a little teeny piece of something to get at the DNA. So there are some people that are starting to do a little bit of that too. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. Wiggum while he's here? Take advantage of it. One comment, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, Dr. Wiggum, just if you don't mind my uh, inserting myself on this. Um, before earlier in the presentation, we were talking about the orchids and ones that grow on trees. And I think you mentioned that you, you refer to them as parasites on trees. In fact, they're not parasitic. They use the tree as an anchor 
And just like they would grow on rocks too. The epiphytes, the word epiphyte means grow upon. And they don't, they don't harm the trees at all. They trap micronutrients in their root system and there's fungi associated with them as well. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, no, I wasn't, I wasn't even implying that. I, I think I did, just didn't say it well. Uh, okay. the, the, the one that I was talking about that is a parasite on a tree, that's, that's an orchid that lives in the soil, not, not on a tree. So what it does is it's in the soil, the fungus is in the soil, the fungus is also attached to the roots in the soil, and the orchid is attached to the fungus, and that's how that works. But you're absolutely right. The, the, uh, the orchids, of which that's the vast majority of them, which are epiphytic, they live up on things, and they, right. but they still interact with fungi, but they're not parasites. You're exactly right, Fred. So sorry if I gave that impression. That's okay. No, I just thought I heard that and wanted to make clear. That's all. Thank you. That's good. No, it's good to be clear. All right, everybody's homework now, now that we're so much smarter, is to make other people smarter and to take this information that we've been gifted um, by Dr. Wiggum and to share it with other folks. Um, and I hope that you will do that uh, early and often. Um, I also hope that we get to see you at another presentation where we can continue to build um, our curiosity muscle and make us um, uh, and make us all smarter. And everybody, be safe. And, and, any other final thoughts or anything for 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 the for the group? Otherwise, we'll pack it up and we'll see you next week with dolphins of the Chesapeake Bay. And thank everybody for, for uh, hanging out for this evening. Uh, those of you who have not been down to Cirque, you can go to our website. We do the, the nature trails are open. You can walk outside and we have miles, several miles of nature trails. So thank you, everybody. Nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful thank you. program. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.